Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Cambridge P500 um, this is a power amplifier or classified as a power amplifier but for clarification this wouldn't be in the same realms for example that you would use in a studio or maybe for a music venue in terms of wattage and output power so the P500 would normally be coupled with the Cambridge C500 so the C500 is effectively the pre-amplifier. So for anyone who is familiar with this series of amplifiers, you have um, the A500, which was both the pre-amplifier and power amplifier mounted into the same unit. But what Cambridge did was to produce two other models, hence the C500 and the P500. So effectively separating the, the, the two components or two uh, functions into separates then. So in terms of general specifications here, and then this is a little bit strange that you see this on the overview uh, in the video, the RMS power output is 55 watts per channel and they quote in the user guide 6 ohm load but the range of speaker impedance that can be connected can be from 6 ohms up to 16 ohms. And then for input sensitivity and again this would be compatible with the C500 preamplifier it's 650 millivolts with an input impedance of 47 kilo ohms and then frequency response is from 10 hertz to 70 kilohertz and then total harmonic distortion would be 0.02 percent with overall weight of about 6.7 kilograms and then dimensions is 90 by 430 by 300 millimeters. Now the issue with this amplifier when it came into the workshop it was sent by a customer. Um, what the customer advised was that they I think they'd connected the amplifier in by wiring but one of the um, connection wires uh, became loose and accidentally which is not uncommon shorted the output terminals on the right channel of the amplifier. Now when I say this is not uncommon, you know, it, it does happen. You know, maybe the customer or the amplifier itself doesn't have maybe, you know, banana plugs that you can push into the back, or maybe you just move the amplifier and the wires become loose and then you get this short. What this amplifier doesn't have is any form of speaker protection circuit. So it's not monitoring for a short circuit on the output of the speaker terminals and then we'll de-energize a speaker protection relay in internally or even have the ability to shut down the power supply. It does have internal protection fuses and you can see in the video these two protection fuses had blown. Um, for the P500 they are fast blow and they're rated at 6.3 amps. That's unlike the uh, P, sorry the A500 which has um, thermal delay or, or, or delay type fuses and they're rated at 4 amps so they're actually higher here because the power output is deemed to be higher and you can see the toroidal is quite substantial as well in the Pi P500 and then what I'm also showing and you can see the crack right the way through one of the SAP 15 uh, series transistors and that's actually the N version which is the NPN version which has failed and then what you always do is you wouldn't just replace the one transistor because the current for the output stage flows through the two transistors it's logical even if the other transistor is not failed is to replace both of them so in terms of fault finding how do you sort of start this well as with all amplifier repairs or electronic repairs once you've got the top cover removed it is a visual inspection so you're just having a look to make sure, you know, can you see anything obvious? And it is common that when these series of amplifiers fail, and that can be the A series P or uh, amplifier, that it normally takes out a number of resistors which are in the pre-driver stage. But strangely and not commonly here, that didn't occur. So when you look, there were no burnt out resistors, and I'll sort of show a zoom in on three resistors which are in the driver's stage and there was no discoloration, no burning but expect on the A-series amplifiers to find those burnt out more commonly. So first thing to do 
is to remove the fixing screws underneath and then what you'll be able to do is raise up the circuit board just make sure that you've removed the rear speaker terminal screws as well and then next phase is to remove the SAP output transistors so it's just a matter of just removing the locking nut and then you can then withdraw the uh, Phillips screw and I'm showing also in the video the output transistors removed what I'm drawing to your attention is because these amplifiers have been in service for many many years decades in fact the heatsink compound starts to dry out it almost becomes like almost like a chalk so of course it really doesn't have any thermal capacity anymore so always replace it even on the channel which hasn't failed you know it's just a simple matter then of just releasing the fixing screw uh, lifting it up and then you'll have a mica washer which is the insulator from the back of the power transistor to the heat sink so just scrape around scrape away any residual old heat sink compound and then you can then apply fresh compound uh, you know don't be scarce with it you know you can put a liberal amount on there and then refit for the unusual for the the non-failed channel you know you can refit the the output transistor put locking screws and then on the fail transistors of course you need to coat the back of those devices and then uh, secure them back in place now when you look you can see that there are five terminals on the Sanken um, Darlington type transistors and we use Darlington transistors because they're able then to deliver a higher power um, which is a requirement for the current output stage uh, of this amplifier now I want to also draw your attention to the bias potentiometer or bias trimmer um, for this amplifier it is 100 ohms now I often describe in some of the tutorials what I refer to as silent killers and what I mean is you know the, the preset potentiometer isn't going to make any noise but when you look from the top and you visually inspect it it looks perfectly fine and you can't see anything untoward but always 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 remove that bias trimmer and test it so as soon as I removed it and put it on the multimeter on resistance I quickly identified that it had gone open circuit and um, this often catches people out when they first do a repair on these amplifiers because you'll replace the output transistors and you're not aware the bias trimmer has failed and as soon as you power it up and again if you power it up not via a bim dimble tester your newly fitted output transistors will just fail on power up so I replace them so I've replaced here both the left and the right channel presets because you know even the working channel has been in there many many years and that gives me a good position then then to start off with when I'm doing the alignment and then doing the bias adjustment as well then and then in terms of additional checks again when I look at the three resistors that are in the video what you can do is you can drop your meter across there and to the resistors because it's within circuit read about 73 ohms and then the final resistor when you look from left to right looking down on them will be about 31 ohms and this is a really great reference check and the reason why is if those resistances are nominal and they will be equivalent then on the working channel you can be very very confident that there's no other components which have burnt out then within the driver stage if you measure and you say okay you know some of the resistances are not correct what you'll then find is the small signal transistor which is uh, relatively close to the resistors will normally have failed and then you can pick that up straight away then and then in the video what I'm also showing as well is the uh, right channel circuit diagram and what it shows you is the driver stage and the output stage and what I've done is I've highlighted their RV202 and that is the bias preset potentiometer and then you can also see U205 a little bit maybe difficult to see but the MPN version is U205 and that's an SAP 15N and then you can see it's equivalent then for the SN, um, SAP 15P for PMP now with this amplifier it doesn't have test points as such so you don't have two prongs coming off the circuit board where you can connect your multimeter 
and then measure directly the millivoltage through the emitter resistors. If you look at the schematic, the five terminals are labelled. So what you need to do is you need to connect your multimeter when set to resistance across pin S and pin E. So if I look from the top and I look viewing from the front of the amplifier, it is the last two pins. And just be careful, so just use some hook clips when you connect across there. And when you look internally, what it is doing is it's connecting across the 0.22 ohm emitter resistor, but it's built into the device, it's not separate. And then I run it up via the dim bulb tester. That verifies that everything is working correctly. What you will find is the dim bulb will initially light bright. That's because the rail capacitors or the main power supply capacitors are charging up perfectly normal. And then I'll just do a nominal adjustment. So I'll probably set it to around 12 millivolts thereabout. And then I will switch over then to direct power. So that's not via the dim bulb tester. And you would expect the millivoltage then to increase, which it does. And then leave it running probably for about 15 minutes. And I can just then do a final adjustment just to bring it in until it's reading a nominal 13 millivolts. And then the only other thing then to check, and you could have done this before or after, it doesn't really matter, is just to check your DC offset. And that's very easy. You just connect your multimeter across the rear speaker terminals. And remember when you're doing the bias adjustment, you don't have any input signal connected and you don't have any speakers connected. And then when you're measuring the DC offset, put your meter across the speaker terminals at the back and you should read a nominal number of millivolts. It could be in the order of say five, six millivolts or maybe on some of the older ones, probably about 15 millivolts. But really you don't want to sort of head towards like 50 or 60 millivolts. If you've got a significant DC offset, then what you'll tend to hear is when the amplifier powers up, you'll hear almost like a thud uh, through the speakers because this big DC offset. Now, what can happen if you're going to go in there and you're going to try and understand what's happened with this DC offset? Commonly, people will tend to look at the output stage of the amplifier, and that's not what, where you need to look. If you refer back, as we see here on the schematic, what you're interested in is that the signal transistors in the very, very early stage of the amplifier section is where you need to look. So if you had a large DC offset, relatively speaking, to the other channel, here you need to look at Q212, Q222, and then if that didn't fix the issue, then you'd be looking at Q221 and then Q220. Now, you're not going to be able to measure these transistors and say, well, yeah, there's an issue here. Just simply substitute them out. Just replace them. And then when you measure that DC offset, in virtually all cases, then you'll measure the, the millivoltage will have fell you know, to nominal value uh, low, definitely below 10 millivolts, and then that's fine. All that has happened is that the transistors over time have drifted, and subsequently that is why you are seeing the, the DC offset. All right, so that really brings us to a close for this repair tutorial. Again, anything that you've learned here can be applied to the A500 or indeed the A5 Cambridge amplifier. And if you need any help, guidance or assistance, my own way, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com and I'll be more than happy to come back to you and give you any support or guidance that you may require. So thanks very much for stopping by. Until the next time, cheers. Bye bye.